should probably unmute mute the mic. So, all right. Here's the problem with images uh, stuff. It's typically associated more with art and with painting. Okay, you know, it's like trying to design a painting based around an image. It's not just supposed to be bowl of fruit. It's supposed to like make you by looking at that bowl of fruit to capture an emotion. All right. And remember, poetry's got really two main points. One is the typical poetry we've read, which is to try to kind of give you, uh, you know, a theme. We're going to talk about, you know, the importance of friendship. We're going to put it in the context of a poem instead of a story. And that's one thing. But the other thing is about poetry trying to recreate an emotion or make you, you know, have the same feelings as the writer. Think about how hard that is. All right? If Thomas comes into school and he's really upset because his dog died, some of you may feel the same way as him. You know, I have three dogs at home, and, you know, this is on a recording, so I'm going to feel like a jerk for saying it, but I don't like my dogs. Okay? I'm not going to hurt one of them, and I would never hit one of them. But if I come home and Alan's like, hey, man, you know, we got a 12 year old boxer. I mean, that's old for a boxer. He's like, his name's Mulligan. If he was like, oh, Mulligan passed away, I'd be like, oh, that sucks. Mitzi's going to be really sad, and I'm not going to cry a bit. Okay, so Thomas is trying to explain to me how he feels about losing his pet. We don't have the same experience. So he's got to find a way to make me feel that way. And that's tough to do. That's why images writing is so difficult. Okay, now that being said, really shouldn't be taught in high school, in my opinion. Main reason being, you guys just aren't going to get it. Even with me giving you a, a, a feedback on it and telling you what you should be looking for and knowing the context, you're going to look at it like, you know, it's just not going to work. Because it's really just not what we think about. I mean, goodness, we don't even get the regular poetry, let alone this stuff. But remember, 11th and 12th grade are built around not just, uh, you know, 9th and 10th grade are what we call survey courses. That's where you just get a bunch of information. You know, we're going to give you a bunch of different writers. This is poetry. This is short stories. Here's an excerpt from a novel. 11th and 12th grade is about, like, going through the history of literature in a country or in a, a section of a country, okay? So imagist writing was important in the U.S. in this brief period of time. In fact, uh, if you look at page 719, one of our guides, Ezra Pound, is one of the most important writers in, uh, in our history, I would argue. Now, I don't like his poetry. I just don't. I've tried, man. Y'all, I don't like this stuff. Why are we teaching it then? Because it's not about what I like. It's about this stuff has value and it has importance and there are people who do it really well. It's just, it doesn't click for me. I think for something to be literary, it needs to have some sort of relevant theme that we can apply later. And this stuff doesn't. But that's not always the deal with poetry. Sometimes it is about trying to capture an emotion. And that's fine. Okay? It really is. So here's what we're going to look at to begin with. Before we get to the poems, because if you look up here for your questions, you've got your first one, what is images and how is it different from the types of poems we have read up to this point? All right. Well, page 718 gives you your definition for imagism. It says, a literary movement that began in the early 1900s by Ezra Pound and other poets. That is not what you write. Okay? Literary movement's fine. But you say, then I would write that, ev that uses, um, evokes emotion and sparks the imagination through the vivid presentation of a limited number of images. Okay? So it's trying to get, you, uh, you know, get an emotion by an image. Again, this is problematic for some of us. For example, for most of us, there's certain things that maybe you have around your house that you go through every once in a while and you find it. Like at Christmas time, you're emptying out you know, all of your decorations and you find that ornament you made in third grade. And all of a sudden it makes you think back to third grade and it gives you that nostalgia, that sort of thing. That's what they're trying to capture in images poetry. Okay? Now that being said, if Cam brings me a little reindeer he made in third grade and shows it to me, I'm not going to care. So he's got to find a way to make me see what he's seeing. That's why this stuff has value. It is really hard to do. It's much harder to convey that for Cam to explain to me why this is so valuable, this little ornament, than it is for me to write a poem about you know, the real meaning of Christmas. Those are, those are very different tasks. So when we look at how are they different, these poems are very short, and they have no real theme. Okay, And that's hard for people. Most people think when we, in, in high school when you read a poem, the first thing you want to do is try to find what the theme was. And that's not what we're doing here. All right. Okay, before we get to the poems, let's look at a little bit of an um, excerpt from an essay that Ezra Pound wrote about how to do this. Because there's a specific way to do it. Why are we wasting our time with that? Two reasons. One, I want you to understand that there is a theory behind this. This isn't lazy writers who just put stuff down and weren't really good. Okay, that's not it. Quit thinking like the way high school kids write. <laughs> These are professional writers. The second thing is, is this actually can apply to regular writing too. So if I ask Johnny to write me an essay like we've done recently, you know, we did last quarter, um, these rules for the most part still apply. All right, so it's, it's good rules to have. This is going to be this question right here. These two are going to go with that. It says, how does Pound describe an image? It's going to be right away. Pound is the author. 
Uh, how does he feel about building a workaround? This is going to be in the first couple of paragraphs. And then you've got this. What are the three rules for, or what are three rules? He gives us about ten. All right, you just pick the three shortest ones and write them down. I don't care. All right? So let's look at this, and then we're going to look at these last two. All right, and we're going to look at the poems. It'll take us probably less than two minutes to read all five of these poems. Isn't that ridiculous? They're that short. All right? Okay, now Ezra Pound's a really deep guy. He writes with really fancy language, so make sure you follow me here because this can be get wordy fast. He says, an image is that which presents as an intellectual and emotional complex in an instant of time. So here's your definition. Here's what an image is to him. Again, a, which, that which presents an intellectual and emotional complex in an instant of time. So it's not just an item. It's something that has in some sort of emotional complexity to it, all right, or makes you think that that's what you're dealing with. He says, I use the term complex rather than the technical sense employed by the newer psychologists such as Hart, though we might not agree absolutely in our application. It is the presentation of such a complex instantaneously which gives that sense of sudden liberation. You notice how I told you this got really deep, really quick? There's a line. It says, that sense of freedom from time limits and space limits. That sense of sudden growth which we experience in the presence of the greatest works of art. Really, imagism is about taking you know, paintings. You know, you see a painting. I don't know if any of you are art people, but you see certain types of painting. I'm this way. I mean, you know, and this is going to sound pretty lame, but I, you know, especially when I was your age, when we used to have things like CD stores. I'd go into the CD store. I'd flip through the stuff. I wouldn't even know who the band was half the time. I'd pick it up based on that looks like cool artwork. All right? And I'd buy it for that reason. Sometimes it was good. Sometimes it wasn't. But for some reason, and I could, if Thomas was like, well, what were you looking for? I don't know. Just something got my attention. You know, I've gone to museums. I have a kid who's really into art, you know, and he, he gets all this stuff. I've been in places before, I'm like, Dad, that's a really cool looking piece of art. I don't know anything about it, but for some reason it gets my attention and I like it. So we're trying to do that and do it now with words. That's tough, especially today when we're visual people. I mean, 100%. We surround ourselves with images daily. So, I mean, honestly, this should work better today. It just doesn't, all right? So we got the definition for image in that first sentence. Here's the second half of this. How does he feel about it? He says, it is better to present one image in a lifetime than pr to produce voluminous works. In other words, he's saying it is more important to produce one solid image than it is to produce, you know, a book that thick. All right? Isn't that crazy? How important does he think it is? He thinks it's the most important thing a writer can do. And you can see why. It's something that lasts over a long period of time. You know, 100 years from now you could read about it and people could still, if you did it well, still get that emotion off of it, even if it's only two lines long, all right? It definitely would represent kind of the peak of the craft. You know, not so much pound, but the next guy we're going to look at, William Carlos Williams, teenagers all over America make fun of his poems and they come up, and you'll see one in just a minute. You can understand why people laugh at it. But, you know, remember, also, he didn't write for 16-year-olds that are in Mobile, Alabama. That really wasn't his purpose. All right, he says, all this, however, some may consider open to debate. The immediate necessity is to tabulate a list of don'ts for those beginning to write verses. He said, so here's a list of things you shouldn't do if you want to try to do this. He says, I cannot put them all into a mosaic negative. To begin with, consider the three propositions, not as dogma. Never consider anything as dogma. By the way, dogma is like a hard and fast rule. You have to do it this way. He says, don't, don't, don't see that. Don't, don't feel like you have to follow these rules. You can break them if you need to. But as a result of long contemplation, which even if it is someone else's contemplation, may be worth consideration. Okay, so now we've got a couple of sections. First one's language. He says, use no superfluous word, no adjective which does not reveal something. So that's, in all honesty, that's the biggest one to me, is that. You know what the term superfluous means? It's a great word. You should learn to use it if you don't. Any clue? Okay, superfluous just means extra that you don't need. All right, superfluous is just additional that you don't need. So don't use words that you don't need, okay? I realize when you write essays for me, you're trying to get to the bottom of that third page. And so you sometimes use additional words. I'm very aware when you do it. It makes your paper worse. It's better to cut that. He says don't use an adjective that doesn't add something to the paper. Sometimes I'll write that. I'm like, cut this sentence out. and Don't write it unless it's going to add to your topic. There's no reason to say it 15 different ways. Say it one way, say it well one way, and then move on. Now say something else. Don't keep saying the same thing over and over and over. All right? Same thing in, in these types of poems. If you're going to repeat the same thing over and over and over, you're going to lose people. They don't care. The goal in these poems is honestly to get as short as you possibly can and use the most powerful words you possibly can. In all honesty, your writing, for the most part, should be the same way. OK, 
Okay. He says, don't use such an expression as dim lands of peace. It dulls the image. It mixes an abstract with the concrete. It always comes from the writer not realizing that the natural object is always the adequate symbol. Do you know the difference in those two terms? Concrete and abstract. Did we talk about this yesterday? Abstract is like it's all over the place. Everything's different. And then it's very. That's close. Very like color. It has like more than what you can see. It has about okay. extra stuff. In now it. you're getting closer to it. It has things that like you, if you read it one time, you won't get everything. Okay. If you read it again and like really think about it, then you get everything. All right, perfect. You're, you're, you're on the track for what I need. More detail than what yeah. you can see. Right, and, and then not being able to see it is key. All right, so here's a, here's a concrete uh, object. If I was to tell, let's pretend all of us could draw, okay? And I said, draw me a picture of a table. We might draw little differences, but they're all gonna be tables, okay? You know, you, when I say table, you think certain things, all right? We can all experience tables with your senses. This table right here, your five senses, you can experience it with at least one of them in a concrete. Now, we can touch this table, you can see the table. The next three are a little bit more problematic. You could, you know, smell it and taste it and all that, but you probably don't want to, but you could, all right? You could do all those things. That is a concrete object. That's what images want. They want more concrete objects because we all understand table, what it is, okay? Sage is right. The abstract kind of goes beyond those senses, though. If I was to say sadness, all right, that's a little bit harder because we all think about different things when we think about sadness. I mean, we may all draw some, a, a, a frowny face or a tear or something, but there's other things that we can associate with sadness too, all right? Even harder, and I, don't, I didn't want to go to the immediate obvious one, but the one every time we talk about concrete and abstract, we talk about things like freedom. The word freedom, you know, that, you have to draw a symbol of freedom. You can't draw freedom. You're sure I can draw the American flag. That's a symbol of freedom. Do you think that means anything to someone who lives in Lithuania? Probably not. Okay? You could draw other symbols. You could draw um, you know, a bald eagle. That's another so thing that's associated with the, with the U.S. You could draw you know, a chain that's been broken. Connor Rockwood said you could draw an AK-47. Well, I guess so. <laughs> All right, if that's what you associate with it. That's the thing that makes it abstract. It, you know, Thomas could argue with me that that's what he thinks about when he thinks about freedom. Thomas can't draw a chair and tell me that's what he thinks about when he thinks about a table. Well, at that point, Thomas is just an idiot, <laughs> all right? <laughs> so you can't do that. You see the difference in concrete and abstract. So in an image's poem, you want as much concreteness as you possibly can get. To be it, fair, you can't really have a table without chairs. I mean, I don't really see a whole lot of tables without chairs around. So. Yeah, but you can't say the, table, the chair is a table. You could say, you know, because there's, I mean, like, uh, there's a lot of restaurants that have those high top tables where you just stand at them. I do, that's fair. Especially like in New York when they're just trying to get people through it, so... Uh, but we could have picked something that not as, you know, if I said table and Thomas drew a bird, we'd be like, mm, Thomas, you, you know, head injury, man. <laughs> What's going on, all right? So, but you know, fair enough, Sage. So, all right. You um, <laughs> just like table, bird. Yeah, that wouldn't work, right? So he says, we want to avoid that. Now, here's the thing. In your essays, I give you that same thing. I'll tell you, hey, use more concrete examples. I mean, give specifics. Don't just say things like, you know, um, legalizing drugs would be harmful for our, our world, our country today. Okay, well. I don't have to agree with you. Tell me why. Give me examples. And don't just say people would become drug addicts. Yes, I get that. Keep going. Why is that an issue? I mean, what? If some guy's a drug addict sleeping in his house, passed out all day, how does that impact me? Why, why am I caring about that? That's your job. Explain it to me. And the more you go down that, the more, you know, the more concrete your stuff gets, the longer those paragraphs get. You don't have to repeat yourself. And that's kind of what the images are working with, too. All right? He says, go in fear of abstractions. In fact, avoid them at all costs. Because we don't always have the same views, all right? Um, it, it happens with like, you know, uh, when we talk about even things like Christianity, you know? Johnny's view of what a Christian is is probably a little different than mine, okay? So, you know, we have to come to an agreement about what that is. Well, you know, a lot of the words we use in church are abstracts. It doesn't mean you can't use them, but you need to back them up with something. Because if you're trying to explain the word holy to someone who's not, imagine, you know, we, we go to a Christian school and we talk about this stuff all the time. You kind of have a loose view of what words like grace and things like that mean. But go try to explain it to someone who's never heard it before. Imagine what it's like to be a real missionary. Go to a place where somebody's never heard of this before and trying to explain it when you don't have any access to concrete uh, wording. Uh, they will get confused really quick. All right? Imagine being in a math class and instead of actually working out a problem on a board, which is a concrete example, all you do is have the teacher try to explain to you without working out an, uh, an example. You know, you'd be dead really fast. You couldn't do it. Abstract is never going to explain. You need the concrete, okay? 
All right, skip to the next paragraph. He says, don't imagine that the art of poetry is any simpler than the art of music or that you can please the experts before you have spent at least as much effort on the art of verse as the average piano teacher spends on the art of music. He compares writing a poem to kind of like being a piano player. There's very few people who can sit down and immediately like are great piano players. Most of them you know, have to practice for a long time to get good. He's saying writing's the same way. Okay, the next, we need some more rules. We've got don't imagine a thing that will go in verse just because it's too dull to go in prose. You know what the difference in verse and prose is? Poetry is verse, everything else is prose. All right, short stories, novels, even like most dramas are gonna be considered prose. Prose is everyday talk. What I'm doing right now delivering to you is prose. All right, if Cam gets up and you know, reads me a poem, that's poetry. If he just tells me what the poem says, now it's prose, all right? So he's saying, don't think that you can put something in poetry because it was too boring to be in prose. Poetry is not where you put, I'm going to describe an apple, because if I did that in a story, it would be boring. You know, that's not what you're supposed to do. So don't be viewy. Leave that to the writers of pretty little philosophic essays. Don't be descriptive. Remember that the painter can describe a landscape much better than you can, and that he has to know a great deal more about it. There's one you probably didn't think we would find here. He says, don't be overly descriptive. All right, if Johnny's describing to me what a field is, give me a couple of really good words to describe a field, because guess what? I know what a field is. I don't need 17 adjectives in front of it to explain to me what a field is. All right, don't waste words. That is really the key here. He says, when Shakespeare talks of the dawn in russet mantle clad, he presents something which the painter does not present. There is in this line of his nothing that one can call description. He presents. He says, don't chop your stuff into separate I ams. Don't make each line stop dead at the end and then begin every next line with a he. Let the beginning of the next line catch the rise of the rhythm wave, unless you want a definite longish pause. Now, this one's kind of confusing for readers. Don't worry. He's basically just saying, don't let the um, shape of the poem dictate your rhythm. Rhythm should be, you know, if you can't, end, if, if the line has to be a certain length and you're not done with your sentence, don't try to force it. Let it carry over. The rhythm is more important than that shape. It says, in short, behave as a musician, a good musician, when dealing with the phrase of your art which has exact parallels in music. The same laws govern and you are bound by no others. A rhyme must have in it some slight element of surprise if it is to give pleasure. Now, I like this one. This was fun last, uh, yesterday, because the sixth period class did this yesterday. And we talked about this and Cam was like, this, Cam woke up. He was like, you're right, Mr. Morris. Rhymes don't work unless they're clever. And that doesn't just mean in poetry. Think about rap music. If it's a boring rhyme that you see coming, it doesn't, you're like, mm, okay. All right, that's not worth it. But when it's something clever, you know, you didn't see that coming, or they, they find an interesting way to present it, that's what makes it good in a lot of cases. All right? Um, and, you know, this guy was writing about poetry back in the 19, early 1900s, and that still carries today. Rhymes need to be clever, not boring. My poor seniors wrote a poem. It was, a, it was an extra credit assignment. I let them write a poem, and, man, I, I regret it to this day. I mean, that was a bunch of really bad rhyming, okay? It was about no rhythm. You know, they'd have one line that was this long, and the next one would be, the next three would be this short, and just like, you know, this long line that ends with the word mouse, and then I have a house, you know, is the next line. And I was just like, you know, this is not good, okay? That's not what you want. In their defense, they weren't really trying, okay? I'm not trying to insult their skills. Um, that's juice on my head, not blood. It looks like something red just appeared on my head. I didn't just crack my skull. All right, um... He says, in short, oh, we read that part. He says, a rhyme must have in it some slight element of surprise if it is to give pleasure. It need not be bizarre or curious, but it must be well used, if used at all. And then finally, we've got, don't mess up the perception of one sense by trying to define it in terms of another. This is usually only the result of being too lazy to find the exact word. So, you know, if I'm talking about uh, Thanksgiving dinner, and you know, when you think about dinner at Thanksgiving, this is the sense that you're going to use a lot of, the smell. That's going to be the nostalgic sense. You're going to think about what it smelled when the turkey was cooking. If I try to be clever and talk about, you know, the feel of the turkey as I sliced into it with my knife, I sound like a psycho killer. I don't sound like, Johnny's not thinking about Thanksgiving dinner. He's thinking Mr. Morris might go nuts. We need to be ready. Okay? So it's like, be careful. Use the right senses and write it in a way that it gets people's attention. Don't be lazy. Look, get the right word. Okay? All right, we're going to end there. That's the end of that, really, besides that last little paragraph. Several rules in there you can pull up. You don't have to have them word for word with his, okay? Just make sure you get those three rules. Now, this is the only question 
that deals with these poems we're about to read. This one's asking you to go find three other Imagist poems. You can just get it on Google, type in Imagist poetry, and then they'll pull some up. Just pull three of them out. We're going to talk about them uh, probably next week. Uh, we'll do our F. Scott Fitzgerald essay, and then we'll come back, and we'll look at those poems. And you may pick some of the same ones. Hey, don't all of you have the same three, okay? Let's not be that dumb, all right? Pick some other ones. We're going to look at how these work, okay? It asks you to find them, cut and paste them, and give me a short sentence or two on what you know, your impression was. Your impression doesn't mean interpret it. There's nothing to interpret. Okay, did you think it, did you like it? Why or why not? Okay, that's all I'm asking. Okay, very simple. So let's go read these. We're gonna read four of these. We're not gonna read the pear tree, but we're gonna look at these other four, okay? So let's look at the first one, Ezra Pound, who's the most famous Imagist writer. Wrote a lot of stuff. Let's see what your books say for you. The apparition of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black bough. It's a whole poem. What's he describing? It's in the first sentence, first line, by the way. What's he describing? Faces. Faces he sees in a crowd. He calls them apparitions. What's an apparition? Your book defines it if you don't know. It's a what? Yeah, and it's something that, it's, like, it's actually like a ghost, to be honest with you. And it's not really there, but kind of is starting to appear. And he's, you know, he's describing like walking through a crowd and seeing these faces kind of appearing. And he describes them as petals on a wet black bough. You know a bough is like a tree limb and like you know, flowers on it, petals from a flower that has been, it's been soaked. The, the, the uh, branch looks like it's black and it's drooping. And the flowers don't look pretty. I mean, they kind of look like waterlogged and stuff like that. How does that possibly describe the way people look? That's how these poems work. It's meant to make Miles stop and say, hmm, how are faces like wet petals on a tree limb? You know, and you got to think, you know, there's a lot of things you can do with that. You can imagine walking through a crowd of people and they just don't want to be there and they're just going through the motions and their faces are drooping. You know, you guys in the hall, when yeah, I'm walking in between. Us at school. Right, <laughs> exactly. Third period, I walk out there and y'all are all like, you know, walking to your next class. You look like petals on a wet black bow. So uh, that's what these are supposed to do. That's why this is actually, believe it or not, as stupid as it may sound, a brilliant piece of writing. It doesn't, length doesn't make it amazing. Okay, Guys, I got a whole bunch of books over here on my shelf that are really thick that no one's ever going to read. Because that's not what makes it good. What you say is what makes it good. All right. Now, this next poem is the one that ever, I remember fondly from high school and us mocking it severely, all right? And I'm still going to. I still don't think, I don't think this is near as good. All right, so we're at the top of 723. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. That's it. Jake's got a little laugh. I mean, what do you do with that? Well, you know what my teacher did? She's like, what do you think he means? What theme is being developed here? There is no theme in that poem. What, well, what does a red wheelbarrow represent? Nothing. It, he's describing a red wheelbarrow, literally. That's it. It doesn't mean anything. He is trying to capture the image of a rainy day when you look outside on the farm. I'm pointing to you guys, sadly. You know, you look outside. There's chickens. There's the wheelbarrow. It's raining. He's trying to re it's, it's about nostalgia, thinking about that image. There's nothing deeper to it. Now, when you realize that, the poem's not so bad. Because I remember looking out my window on rainy days. Not about, never owned a chicken in my life that wasn't dead and about to go on my stomach. But I remember looking out the window and seeing my poor dogs when it was raining, and they're too dumb to get in the doghouse. I remember looking out there at the doghouse with the rain and the dog standing there in the mud, staring in the window at me the whole time. Okay? I remember that. And really, that means the poem achieved its, its what it's doing at that point. It's trying to get me to picture. It's about image. That's it. There's, no, there's nothing in depth like to this. Let's look at the next one. Same author here. He says, I have eaten the plums that were in the icebox, which were probably, you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me. They were delicious, so sweet and so cold. That's a whole poem. That's it. Hey, my bad, I ate your food. The end. All right? So what theme is there? Nothing. What do the plums represent? Plums. They're just plums. Now, I am sure there's all sorts of people out there who can make a huge deal out of this. I find that to be a bad idea. Okay? But you know what I'm reading this? I'm thinking about, I remember, uh, you know, going to... Uh, the refrigerator in the morning and my kid, you know, my kid works at Moe's and I refuse to eat at Moe's because they won't make people wear masks. So I'm not trying to get coronavirus and diarrhea. So uh, I won't eat at Moe's anymore. Uh, I just said diarrhea on my recording. Awesome. All right, anyway, <laughs> uh, I won't eat there, but he'll bring home stuff sometimes and I'm like, ooh, I kind of want that, you know. And, you know, I'll, and I, I, I'm catching that from this poem. I remember opening up the refrigerator and looking at that burrito sitting there and going, man, do 
I might eat this. You know, I, I, I really want to. And it reminds me of what it's like to be hungry and see something someone else has. Plus, I don't like plums, but I'm reading, and it's such simple wording, delicious, so sweet and so cold. And I'm like, I might want a plum. You know, I don't ever want to eat a plum, but I'm sitting here thinking maybe I do. This works like commercials work today. I'll be sitting at home. I will just eat. I'll, I'm full. I'm not, I don't want to eat anything. I'm watching Hulu or whatever, and a McDonald's commercial comes up, and I'm not thinking about McDonald's, but you know what? I really want some French fries now. Okay? So that's what I get from this. Here's the thing with images poems. It really doesn't matter as a teacher what I get. Randy's going to have a different experience entirely. The point of an images poem is just to get you to have an experience and think about something. All right? That's the key. A good image is going to provoke a response. And we may all have different responses, and that would make a really good class. Okay? That's why you're doing this down here. You're going to pick some image poems. Uh, Thomas might pick the same thing that Sage did, but you may look, think about something totally different when you see it. All right? This isn't so much about, you know, I've heard people tell me, well, this is about you trying to recollect exactly what the author was thinking when he looked out his window and saw a red wheelbarrow and some white chicken. I don't think that's necessarily the case. Maybe. But I think it's more about, you know, just getting me to think about, you know, images of that similar, that similar nature that are important to me. Okay? Does that make sense? I hope y'all don't hate this as much as I did when I was in school, because you know what we were told? Read these and then answer these questions. And I was like, oh, this isn't poetry. And it's really not. But it does do something unique because in all honesty, and thank God I didn't make you do this. If I was like, all right, I want you to write a poem where you try to capture an image. I, mean, I get a lot of stuff like, uh, my room is really messy. I saw clothes in the corner. I mean, that's, that's what you get. But you know what? It works. I'm thinking, yeah, my room's really messy too. There's clothes on the corner too. I'm not picturing Miles' room. I've never seen Miles' room. Okay? I'm picturing my room. Okay, and that's, this is so much more of a personal type of writing, in my opinion, than some of the poems we've read, which have a definite meaning. All right? That makes sense? Did that help y'all some? Forget the last two poems. Who cares? I've made my point. Yes? It's 11.48. Well, this is a good spot to stop then, isn't it? All right. Let me stop the video, and you guys did a great job.